<laughs> oh, that's hilarious. That's all right. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is day eight of the 10-day Ultimate Weight Loss Bundle Experience, where I feature contributors from the Rundle every day, anywhere up to five times a day, so that you can find out not only more about them, but the product they contributed. And today is a perfect example why you have to buy the bundle. Today's guest is Andrew Mellon. He is one of the smartest, funnest, kindest, mm-hmm. most interesting people I've ever met. I met him at Rancho La Puerta. We were both guest speakers there at uh, one of the weeks, and I immediately took his classes. I, I took a private with him, and I've had him on the show, and, and people love him. But the product that he contributed to the bundle cost $97. He didn't pretend it cost $97. It's a real product that he actually sells on his website. It's a recorded course for $97. You can verify it for yourself. But when you get the bundle, it's $49, which is about half the price of this extraordinary product, plus another 111 products worth <laughs> almost you know, $4,800. But I want to tell you about his product because I've been using it as an example why to buy the bundle. Because even if that was all you got from the bundle, this is worth it. I have listened to this now three or four, four times, actually, three and a half times, and I've taken extensive notes, and we're going to talk about it. It's called Calling BS on Busy. And the reason I'm so interested in Andrew's work is because it really is the opposite side of the coin of the work that I'm doing. And and this is from Dr. Doug Lyle, by the way, who said, unless you have a clean environment, you're not going to be successful. And I'm not just talking about a clean environment if you're trying to lose weight and manage food addictions, clean of junk. But if you are living in a messy environment, you're not going to get anything done. You're not going to get any of your work done. I mean, there's research that shows this. Andrew's going to talk about this. And and I've noticed because even before I met Andrew, I noticed it with the thousands of people I work with privately, the ones that never made their bed in the morning were never successful losing weight. And you might think, well, that's a big thing. I'm too busy. Well, Andrew's going to show you that if you're too busy, he's going to call (laughs) BS on it. And how until you work on some of these yeah, issues, you're never going to lose weight. Please welcome Andrew Mellon. I am such a fan of your work. I cannot tell you how much I am a fan of it. Oh, it's mutual, Chef AJ. I love you. And I'm just so delighted to be here with you and with everybody. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, I've talked to Dr. Lyle, who's like the, the psychologist in our world for, for people that are plant-based and he's an evolutionary psychologist. And he's always said that if, that it, not just for weight loss, but that if you don't have like, like you can't see my desk right now, but it's, you know, probably could be better, but at least I know where everything is using your system, a, a home for everything, you know, one in, I, I know the organizational triad, but he said, Says that when you have like when you walk into your office and it's really messy and it's all these stacks of papers, it creates what's called cognitive overwhelm, cognitive overload. And you that's why people can't get anything done. And if you're trying to affect a permanent dietary or lifestyle change, good luck until you organize better. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's so true. I mean, if it the outside does reflect the inside and vice versa. So if your mind is cluttered, if your space is cluttered, it's you're just, you're hobbling yourself before you even start. And why would you, why would you not do everything you could to set yourself up for success? It, I mean, objectively, if, if you could pull yourself out of all of the story in your life and just look at the choices that you're making objectively, if it was somebody else's life, you would of course say, well, uh, yes. I mean, if your kitchen's a mess, if you can't find things in your kitchen, if your home is a mess, if your office is a mess, if your bedroom is a mess, you're not getting good sleep, you're not getting good rest, it's impossible to feel safe and grounded in your own home, it would all make sense. It's when it becomes about you, one, that's where all the story comes up of like, well, but, 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 all of the excuses and, and explanations for why you are the exception to the rule and why you are still gonna be successful even though you're stacking the odds against you. And it's just BS. I mean, it's you're, you aren't the exception. I've been doing this work for over 25 years. I've worked with over a half a million people around the world, right? I've yet to meet the exception to these rules where they don't apply and you get the pass, right? You get to keep your bad, ineffective, inefficient behavior on uh, intact and still get the results that you want. It just, it, the math doesn't add up. So you gotta, you've got to clean the slate literally. You've got to start from a clean, 
organized and it, you don't need to be crazy about it, but you have to be able to find your keys when you need them. You have to be able to find your wallet when you need it, your bag when you need it, your mobile phone. You can't be losing those five, 10, 15 minutes every time you're running around the house looking for something and think that you're gonna make up the lost time. You can't, once the time's been spent, it's gone. And it's one of, the, it's one of those 200 lies that we tell ourselves every day, right? It's like, I'm gonna make up that lost time. But it's not like money. You can invest money. You can save money. You cannot bank time. So once you spend it, whether you spend it playing solitaire on your phone or, you know, death scrolling through the news or, uh, you know, scrolling through social media or taking, you know, taking a, an extra 15, extra 15 minutes, right, to check your email instead of walking out the door so you can be on time for your kid's soccer game or for your appointment, you're not going to get that time back. And you're just going to make yourself miserable trying to do, trying to close the gap between what you actually have available to yourself and what you want to believe you have available. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I remember a long time ago in college, one of the things I learned I don't remember much is that the teacher said that like, like life isn't fair, that people have different, you know, different genetics and different uh, financial status, things like that. But the only thing in life that's fair is time. We yeah. all get the same 168 hours and it's how we use them. And you said that people, how many minutes a day do people spend looking for lost items? Oh, I mean, you know, the average, uh, the average person will waste a year of their life cumulatively looking for lost or misplaced items. So you can just do the math. I mean, and, and it does happen in those five and 10 minute increments because you'll tell yourself, I know a shortcut. I'm going to make up the lost time. You'll tell yourself some pile of baloney that's going to pre prevent you from actually getting honest with yourself. It's just another form of denial that you can shove between you and the reality that you're squandering your time and you don't need to feel guilty or ashamed or uncomfortable about that. It's, it's never, this kind of information is never a gotcha piece of information that's used to, to humiliate you. It's the key to unlocking a new choice or a new way of moving through time and space. So, but you have to, you have to get the truth first before you can build off of it, right? If you're just in denial, if you're lying to yourself, you don't have anything solid to hold on to. You don't have a, a clear foundation. And that, that's where we wanna to get to in, with, in the idea of calling BS on busy is just tell the truth about how you're spending your time. You don't have to feel bad about it. Once you know how you're really spending your time, now you can make different choices that are more in align with your values. It's, it's, it's not complicated, excuse me. Uh-oh. Bless you in advance. <laughs> Woohoo! Well, that means it was the truth. My grandma exactly. said Exactly. Sneezing on the truth. That's what yeah. my grandmother used to always say. Yep. Yeah. You know, I, I always tell people that if you're on, if you have a Facebook account or an Instagram account, you then that is a lie that you have no time because people right. waste so much time on social media. And I believe I heard you say, you really don't use it for social. You use it for business and that's it. And right. same here. I don't use it. I mean, people think I use it because they see me, but I don't use it. Yeah, I mean, and look, I, there's plenty of ways to use social media in strategically that, I mean, in our cases, we use it for our businesses and as a way to connect with people, because there's a lot of people that I'd like to connect with in small doses. And at the same time, it's a place where you, it's a, just a, it's a huge, it's like the Grand Canyon of rabbit holes that you can get lost in if you're not mindful before you walk into it. The time... The time to be clear about your choices is not after you're lost. You know, I talk all the time when I'm teaching project management and time management to folks. The time to have the map is before you enter the woods, not, not when you're halfway into the woods. That's not the time to start looking for a map to get yourself out of the woods. You want to have the map before you go into the woods. Absolutely. Where do you get, you, I've heard you say we tell ourselves 200 lies a day. Really? That many? I mean, yeah. I'm not aware. Yeah, yeah. I, I can share, I can, uh, uh, after we're, after we're, after, after we're off this call, I can share the link with you of where that statistic comes from. Yeah. Wow. Great. I, you know, I loved the, the calling BS on busy and the bonus Q and A. And one of the things that really, 
I never thought about before, but I thought about this. And this is why our work parallels. You talked about using outside accountability to wedge yourself into action. And we talk about that with weight loss, getting an accountability buddy, but I never thought it about like getting a clutter buddy or, you know, or getting an organizational buddy. That's brilliant. I never thought to use an outside source for that. Yeah, no, it's essential. I mean, look, you triple your success rate when you are not the person who is holding yourself accountable. And so if you could get three times the result, whether that means the results are happening three times quicker, three times bigger, why would you not avail yourself of it? It's Again, it's only because of how you might be viewing yourself, your self-concept, that you, you know, you are self-reliant and all, again, just part of those 200 lies, right? That I don't need any help. I can handle this. I've got it. I just need the information. And then that's all I need. And I'm off to the races. I'll be fine. I use a trainer three times a week. I know how to pick up heavy objects. I mean, they're kettlebells. They're not, it's not complicated. I do much better on a Zoom call with my trainer than I do ever by myself. And it's not like, again, I'm not doing quantum physics. I'm literally picking up a 30 pound kettlebell, swinging it over my head and putting it back on the ground. This is, no, this is nothing that is mysterious to me. And still, I get better results when Michael's on the Zoom call with me than when I'm by myself. So why would I not take advantage of that if I'm going to get the results that I want? Because ultimately, right? I mean, whether it's weight loss, better time management, better organization. I, it's the results that we're looking for. I'm not, I don't really love the process. I'll do the process to get to the, to get to the product, to get to the result. And so if there's a way to speed that up and to stack the odds in my favor, why would I not do that? Particularly if it's legal, right? I mean, you know, I'm not interested in, in, um, necessarily cheating my way to better results, but I would certainly do everything I could to get there quicker if there's a, a way to get there quicker. Great. Thank you. Joyce says she's in your class. I was so excited when I had you on your sh on the show. So many people took your, your challenge, your five-day challenge. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I love that uh, our five-day challenge. We do this uh, two or three times a year. We did one back in January, and then uh, we'll do another one in May, starting on May 9th. And you can join up. It's a dollar a day, so five bucks for five days. And, um, and you know, we used to do it for free, and we found that uh, by charging people a little bit of money, we had such better turnout. Again, accountability. It just ties back into accountability. I, if I could give it to you for free and you would show up, I would give it to you for free. The thing is that when you have a little bit of skin in the game, when you put your five bucks down, now you're actually going to show up because you're like, well, I spent the five bucks. I better show up. Right. And it's, it doesn't, it's not like I need to charge you $500. I just need you to have any skin in the game is the missing element to making sure that you show up. Because again, my home is organized. I'm not doing the challenge for me. I'm doing the challenge for y'all. So <laughs> it doesn't talking to myself on zoom for five days means nothing to me. Right? Like I know how to do this stuff. I'm trying to, I'm I'm trying to jumpstart and kickstart your decluttering process. So of course, whatever it takes to get you in the room so you get the benefit. And it's, it's, it's amusing to me, right? That we are, we can create, we build computers and roads and bridges and, you know, spaceships. We can do all of these things. And yet when it comes to showing up and doing the things that actually benefit us and provide, you know, a better quality of life and a, hopefully a longer life, uh, more happiness, we somehow seem to have so many stumbling blocks. We can't seem to figure out how to just show up for that stuff, right? It's just, it's mind blowing the, the human condition in that way. Uh, Joyce says she's taking your class and oh this is Joyce I think up in Seattle yeah uh, well Joyce Glasgow maybe yeah. Uh, yeah and we have Kathy Switzer who says Andrew is helping me get decluttered organize and lose weight with mind shifts and stopping lying to myself thank you awesome okay. hey wait Excellent. I can't do that, but it just scares my poor doggy so much. Yeah. Okay, so let's see. We have a comment. I've always thought I had no time until I started time blocking. It was a game changer. Suddenly, I had a purpose for each hour of the day. Yeah, it's so funny, right? I mean, when you don't pay attention to it, it's like you get a new car 
and then suddenly everybody on the road is driving your car, right? Or you read a book and then you suddenly discover everybody's reading that book. It's until it's in your consciousness, we're just oblivious and we're just moving through. We're moving through the day, not really paying attention. Now, this is an interesting comment from Susanna, who's having some really incredible success uh, with changing her lifestyle and losing weight. And she's been on fire lately. She won the Nutra Milk Machine. She was called on stage for the magic show. And here's what she said. She said, I took your challenge, but I wasn't mentally ready. Too much going on mentally where I was way off plan with my eating. I may take it again. Do we have to be mentally ready to, to declutter, to lose weight? How important is our mindset? Oh, it's key, right? If, if you can't change how you think about, feel about, and then interact with stuff, you're just gonna, you're just, it's like, what do they say? Changing seats on the Titanic, right? You're just, it, it, on some level, the boat's going down. So it doesn't really matter whether you're in steerage or first class, the boat's going down. So you definitely wanna be in the right frame of mind. And I will say that the one place where you can fudge that is if you are willing to be willing to change your mind, you just need a crack in the door, enough to let some fresh air in and a new perspective, right? If you're, if you're well defended with lots of reasons for why this is not going to work or not going to work for you now or not going to work for you in the way that it's being shared with you, then it's not going to work, right? Henry Ford, um, famous anti-Semite, uh, <laughs> said, and actually he was quoting um, uh, Buddha, who said, uh, if you think you can or if you think you can't, you're right. So it's true. I mean, if you want to believe that you have to get all your ducks in a row before you can make any sort of a change, then you will, you will build a system in which all your ducks must be in a row before that happens. The challenge with getting all your ducks in a row is like herding cats, right? I mean, ducks don't necessarily want to stay in a row. So it's, it's an elusive goal you're chasing after. If you're, if you're telling yourself that everything has to be perfect before I walk out the door, right? I mean, it's better to take a step forward imperfectly than to wait for perfect trajectory and never taking any steps forward. Right. That, that's so funny that you said that saying herding cats. I've been hearing it a lot lately, actually from Barry from Rancho La Puerta. So I've been trying to organize a week's worth of shows like we do this show every day featuring Rancho La Puerta. And Barry thought it was a great idea. So did uh, Victoria and, and Deborah Seke is going to be a guest. Right. Awesome. And so, yeah. But, but listen to this. So Barry gave me the names of you know the people and he chose and I, I emailed them. I texted them in, in only two got back to me. And he said, look, it's like herding cats. And, and it, it's, you know, I wonder why it is. Are they, I mean, I'm not, I'm not ragging on these people because it's not just them, but no, 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 right. are, are people really that busy, especially when I saw them at the ranch, like Manuel. And I said, would you like to be on my show? Oh yes. Here's my number. I mean, when people never get back to you, do what, I mean, are they, is it, because, do they, how do you not take it either personally or just assume, well, oh, they're not interested. Right. Well, that's just an invitation. You know, the four agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, you just take nothing personally. It has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with them and whatever stories they're running and the 200 lies that they're telling themselves about, I don't have any time. I'd love to be on Chef AJ's show. I just can't get my shit together. I, you know, it'll have to, or, or you know, they'll tell themselves, I'll, I'll get back to her later, right? They, they're not using the air quotes, but it's, completely implied. I'll get back to her later. I've got to put out these fires first and then that'll that'll naturally rise to the top of the list and I'll deal with it in a bit. We also have to remember, right, that um, when the house is not literally on fire, and I talk about this in Calling BS and Busy, when the house is not literally on fire, urgent and important are not in sync. If the house is on fire, literally, right, urgent and important, completely simpatico, they are bound up. It is urgent and important that you get out of the house now. If the house is not literally on fire, right, you're in your head someplace and you will constantly be distracted by what is urgent. And urgent is what's busy, it's shiny, it's flashy. It's going to steal your focus and it's going to pull you away from important if you do not know what important is and if you are not basing your choices on what is important to you every day. And look, you don't have to do it perfectly but you do need to know what's important to you so that when somebody offers you an invitation and says, would you like to be on my show and reach, you know, hundreds of thousands of people and help elevate the ranch 
its visibility, your visibility, support folks, show up here, click this link, set up an appointment, you would think that they would do it. And some other noise is busy and in front of them and they're, you know, they're telling themselves one of their 200 lies. I know. I mean, I just, I mean, I know I'm busy too. When I don't get back to people, I say, I can't get back to you or I have somebody else do it. And I find sometimes like, not that some people are more important, but sometimes the busier and more, you know, bigger the people are, the more likely they are to get back to me. And I'll never forget, you know, it's, it's really interesting because there was a man and he's passed away, but I, I'll never forget this because his name was Gary Lamell. And he was at the time, this was 1985, the president of Warner Brothers Music. And my friend was his executive assistant. And so he was a pretty big wig, right? Yeah. And I remember one time um, because he, he was talking about his mother, how she celebrated the Shabbat, at, you know, and she misses homemade challah or something. And I knew how, and I made him a challah. It was like not a big deal to me. I was his chef, but I remember he wrote me this handwritten thank you note. And when I saw him, I'm like, I was shocked, like that somebody I, I mean, that made this much money that, you know, has lunch with Clint Eastwood and Barbara Streisand took the time not to have Elaine, my friend, dictate it. And 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 I and I, I remember asking about it. And he said, well, that's the secret to my success. It was something like the fact that he did get back to the little people. And, and I, I never forgot it. And I always do that. And I'm not not always do that, but I always try to like write a thank you and, and acknowledge people because I just think about him. And it's like, if this guy had time to write me a thank you, I got time to answer your email. And if I don't, then I'm going to say, look, I'm really busy right now. I'm going to answer it as soon as the bundle's over kind of thing, you know, but I yep. don't ignore people because I think it's rude. <laughs> right. Well, and yes, I, I, I hear everything you're saying. The only part that I would offer you, you know, a different perspective on is you don't need to take it to the place of it being rude. It's, it's unskilled. It's, um, it's there. It's the, they're on their spectrum of connecting the dots. And we don't, I think it's just better emotionally and psychologically for us. The, the people who would normally take offense at not hearing back from people when we've extended ourselves toward them, towards them to not read anything into it. And it doesn't need to become rude because then it makes them wrong, right? It's just, you didn't get what you wanted. No expectations and no assumptions will you and I will both be happier. And when we hear from them, if we hear from them, it'll be a treat rather than like, oh, finally you got around to it, right? I just think it's better to dismantle all of that kinds of- Don't have expectations. Don't yeah. have expectations. I Zero get expectations. I get what you're saying. I know I got to get back to that Miguel Ruiz book. You're, yeah. Of course you're right. You're right about everything. What can I tell you? Now, one of the things you've said often is 80% of the stuff around our house we will never use again. And- uh, so like, what about, like, I was thinking today that I, I mean, I'm fine physically, but I have a neck traction machine and it was kind of expensive. Do I get rid of it and take it to Goodwill? And then if the, 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 the nerve acts up again, buy another, you know, things like that. Or I live in the desert. Do I get rid of my umbrella? Do, do you know what I'm saying? There's like that gray area of things that it's not like I'm attached to them emotionally, sure. but, but do I get rid of them and just buy them again? That's my question with that little gray area of things. Yeah. So let's be clear that, um, the interpretation of that statistic is not necessarily to get rid of your only umbrella. So if you have one umbrella, even though you live in the desert, you might want to hold on to that in case you drive to someplace where it rains uh, or you fly to someplace where it rains and you don't need to buy an umbrella. Now you might want to have a smaller, like if you, you know, if, if in the olden days, meaning pre desert, you had a golf umbrella that you you can't easily throw in a bag and take with you portably, you might want to swap that for something that's more easily portable given that you don't really need it where you live but you might need it where you travel so that's a that's a swapping experience and, and likewise with your neck brace i would say uh what's the likelihood for it to return is there some is there some sort of a like through next door or some sort of resource sharing app where you could put it in the middle so anybody who had a neck issue could use it I mean, you might still retain ownership of it, but it was available to be shared as a resource so other people didn't need to buy it and it wouldn't necessarily need to be underfoot in your home all the time. It, it, when it comes to those kinds of specialty things, that it, it isn't that they are exceptions to the rule and at the same time, they're specialty items. So 
looking at through looking at them through the lens of what was the investment to have it how much space do they take up are they crowding out something else that could live in that space and if the answer is no to that then it doesn't really matter if it's sitting on a shelf in your garage or it's at the goodwill it it isn't intruding or keeping you from storing you know you know your, your hanukkah or christmas decorations so it's only when it's competing with other things that are more important that need that storage space where the uh, the snugness of that reality becomes much more acute, right? Where where things are competing for very limited real estate space. Does that make sense? Yeah, got it. I sometimes just keep those like because um, superstition. Like I think, well, as long as I have it, I probably won't get injured again. I know that's yeah, well, that's weird, a two hundred. That's one of your two hundred lies. That's one of my two hundred lies. That's yeah. great. I'll, okay, so so many people have taken your class and saying things like. Uh, one thing that I started doing after Andrew's five-day course was calling for a thrift store pickup every two to three weeks. They come if you have five bags or boxes. So that's kind of cool that I did not know that they come. Yay! Excellent. And then a bunch of people have taken it and have nice, nice feedback about it. I'll find another great comment. Oh, Diane had a comment about how it's really helping her declutter because she has a big job to do. So one of the things I love that you said in the course that they get for $49, which costs from $97 plus another $4,700 worth of wonderful content from plant-based doctors, influencer chefs, athletes, as well as over a thousand recipes that it wasn't hard to stay organized until you started accumulating things. That is so true. Yes. Right. Right. I mean, we're all born organized, right? We come into the world with nothing. It's so it's one of those two, it's another one of those 200 lies, right? Is that... <coughs> oh, I didn't get the organizing gene. Look, everybody came with the, I mean, I get that everybody's DNA is different. And at the same time, they've mapped the human genome. There isn't an organizing gene. When you have too much stuff, it's hard to keep track of it, whether you're me, the most organized man in America, or you're just anybody. It, too much stuff is too much stuff. Again, often where people get tripped up is then the stories that they tell themselves about like, oh, I'm such a schmuck because I have all this stuff. I'm such a jerk. I'm so stupid. Why can't I figure this out? What's wrong with me? All of that is wasted time, wasted energy, and it does nothing to disentangle you from the stuff. It just keeps you in, in some ways peculiar, peculiarly more bound to the stuff because now it's part of your identity, right? Like I am a clutterer, or, I am a hoarder, or, I have too much stuff as if that defines you. It's, you have a lot of belongings in your space. They aren't you, they don't define you. You are not your stuff. It's just stuff. The, the sooner you can disentangle yourself from all of the attachments and all of the story, the stuff will leave much quicker. Yeah. It seems like people like stuff. Like even when I see homeless people, they have a lot of stuff. Even if it's stuff that maybe we wouldn't think is valuable, people seem to like to collect stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we, we have 750,000 years of horror, of hunting gathering in our history. So, I mean, I saw the same thing. I was driving uh, home from the doctors to for, for this call today. And I, I saw a guy on the side of the street, uh, homeless, with a shopping cart. And I thought, God, it's so, first of all, if you got to be homeless, I suppose California and Florida are some of the better places to be uh, under, uh, under uh, domiciled. Uh, and uh, he was without a home and with a shopping cart full of things. And who knows what's in there? But clearly, those are his belongings. And yes, we will, we will roll the shopping cart right to the grave. We, we are hardwired. Part of our survival is about keeping things and holding on to them. In the, in the prehistoric times, it was about food, right? It was about food and probably bear skins or something that was going to keep you warm and something that you could build a fire with because that's how we survived. And then we needed to, we didn't need, life was not quite for many of us that um, 
that uh, transactional, that we didn't need to be hunting and gathering, but the impulse, the drive in us is still very strong. So then we go shopping, right? We accumulate things, we uh, collect things, we, we create hobbies for ourselves. Again, be, because curiously, right, we don't have enough time for the things that matter, but we do have time to be flipping through magazines or looking for more yadros or hummels or coins or stamps to collect. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, the human condition is truly fascinating to me. One of the things you said that was like brilliant was if you have too much stuff or if you have too much to do, then you are in a state of abundance. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's the very definition of abundance is more than you need, right? More, more than is necessary. And yet, because of our faulty thinking because of our mindset, we tend to think of it as a burden, right? I'm burdened with too much stuff. There, and certainly, again, we just, I mean, most topically in this exact moment, right? There's a war going on in Ukraine uh, with the Russian aggressors and th those, th some of those people there are gonna be very grateful to have anything right now, food, clothing, and shelter. And the idea that, I mean, that's, that's a desperate situation for, for people who have too many things in their garage, instead of feeling burdened about it, if you could have, if you could tap into any sense of gratitude around, I have more than I need. I, I, I have nothing to worry about unless I want to worry because food, clothing, and shelter are completely taken care of. It's tremendously freeing if you will give yourself over to that mindset. And again, it's one of the places people trip themselves up because they will go, yeah, but, yeah, but, this is why I'm not grateful for it. And, and I, again, no judgment for me, it's just an opportunity for you to look at why would you hold on to a mindset in which gratitude was not easily accessible to you and that you would cling to a point of view in which you were burdened by bounty? It, it logically doesn't make any sense. So it's clearly either psychologically or emotionally or both, there's some hook there for you. And it's an opportunity for you to look at that and see why would you hold on to that? Why would you keep that hook in your mouth, literally or figuratively, instead of opening your mouth and letting the hook fall out and say, yeah, I actually, I'm, I'm doing fine. I, I'd like fewer things in my home. I'd like fewer distractions. And all things considered, I'm ahead of the game. Yeah. I love how you always say clutter is just deferred decisions. And I think it's just like making the bed or, or exercising. If you don't do it first thing in the morning, it just hangs over your head and it just, and, and then you pretty, pretty much never do it. I mean, come on, if you didn't make your bed in the morning, you're really going to make it at 10 o'clock before you go to bed? Probably not. And it becomes another one of those 200 lies, right? Well, tomorrow will be different. It's not going to be different unless you make it different. Otherwise it's going to just be a repeat of today. So what, would, what, would, what about tomorrow is going to make it easier for you to make your bed, easier for you to get down and do 10 push-ups, easier for you to take a walk around the block, easier for you to, you know, blend up a smoothie instead of grabbing a bag of chips. It's nothing about tomorrow is inherently any different than today, except that you have this cockamamie lie that it's because you want it to be different. It will be different. And today is a lost day. The reality is today, this moment right now, is the only moment when you actually have any agency to affect any change in your life. If you're thinking that tom uh, th tomorrow's not guaranteed. So put, pine, pinning all your hopes on tomorrow being the better day where you are self-actualized is another one of your 200 lies because this is the only moment when you have any shot at self-actualization and being present and living the life you want to be living. People do the same thing with weight loss. They're going to do it um, someday. You know, when they get back from the cruise, when their kid graduates high school or college, uh, after their kid leaves home, after their daughter gets married, after tomorrow, they, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, the road to someday leads to never. Exactly. Exactly. You know, I, I it's been a rough day. I'm just going to have a cookie today. Tomorrow, I won't eat any cookies. Tomorrow, no sugar. Today, today, one cookie. How how bad? I'll just do a few more push-ups that I don't do. I'll just do a few more sit-ups that I'm not doing, and I'll pay it back. Right? I mean, it's it's all just bad math. <laughs> Maybe you know I've heard Dr. Lyle, this, our psychologist friend, say that the reason for procrastination is that the hope that maybe then they won't have to do it at some point. Well, I guess if you're dead, I mean. <laughs> 
what like th that just seems like the booby prize to me right like oh finally i don't have to do any more squats because i'm dead I, <laughs> if the choice is squats and not a saggy butt or dead i vote for the squats like i'll, I'll do the squats don't want to do them but i want to i want a saggy butt less then I am willing to do squats. Yeah. Susanna says, this is a great perspective from Andrew. I'm burdened by bounty and I'm going to start doing something about it today. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. So you, one of the things that was really interesting is you said we lose time complaining. And what I hear a lot from my people is uh, they, they say they can't clean their environment because, you know, they give like all these reasons and all they do is complain. And I'm like, the time they spent complaining, they could have had a session with Dr. Lyle to figure out how to negotiate a clean environment or work with somebody like you. But that is really a time waster complaining. I, you say 200 lies. I wonder how many hours people spend complaining about the problem, but doing nothing about it. Yeah, well, I mean, it would be a wonderful, noble experiment to see if you could make it through an entire day without complaining. I was walking on the beach yesterday and I was listening, listening to the conversations and, and not with this in mind, but just listening to how often the conversations people were having were some sort of justification, rationalization for being upset about something and trying to convince somebody that their point of view was correct. And I just, it, it just, it struck me again, because I would just rather be silent than to start to complain. It's, it, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't take you any place. Uh, and it just reinforces a mindset in which you are not the hero, you are the victim which is just not where I want to live, right? I mean, it's just, it's not where I want to live. Yeah. Kelly says, thank you, Chef AJ, for introducing us to Andrew. I'm getting every room in my house decluttered. Yep, awesome. that's what I do. I like to be the one that finds the people and brings them to the village. Okay, oh, all right, this is funny. Have you ever done like stand up? Because you're, you're so funny and witty. It's the one thing that I haven't done. I mean, I did a lot of improv when I was uh, when I was uh, an actor and working in the theater. But uh, I love improv. Maybe you'll take stand, stand up. up. Maybe you'll take my class next time because you're really good. Because you said something in this class that I thought was so funny, and it reminded me of something that Dr. Ellen Goldhammer says. Dr. Ellen Goldhammer often says when people say, "Well, can I have you know this?" highly addictive substance over this one. And he'll say, just because something is less bad doesn't mean it's good. And you said something that tickled me. You said, you don't get bonus points for being better than the worst person you can possibly imagine. <laughs> right, I mean, it's like, that That becomes like the game that people will play. Like, well, I'm better than Susie. I mean, Susie's a hot mess. Everybody knows Susie sucks, right? Like, so so that's, that's that those are your props, like I'm better than Susie, be better than Susie. I mean, Susie needs some help. We should all be pitching in to help Susie get her shit together. And we should not be comparing ourselves to Susie feeling better about like, well, I'm not Susie. I'm not the worst person I could imagine, right? I'm not that person. So it's, I'm okay. Be the best person you can be, not the better version of somebody that needs your sympathy and help. Great, got it. Procrastination is one of the seven, and then here my handwriting went bad. Deadly lies, was it? Uh, the deadly time thieves, and actually we've increased it to eight. <laughs> there are now eight deadly time thieves, yep. So uh, interruptions, poor planning, uh, over committing, multitasking, email, meetings, procrastination, and social media. Those are the eight deadly time thieves. And I'll do this one more time for you. Interruptions, poor planning, multitasking, over committing, emails, meetings, procrastination, and social media. Yeah, yep. Those you know what? You every time. One of the things I learned, and again, I'm not kidding. When I said I I listened to your class three times because I think I was multitasking the first two, so I didn't clean <laughs> everything, which you say you can't do multitasking because that's just doing many things poorly. But I always wondered because I, I, I'm i I'm fairly new to texting. Like I didn't have an iPhone until it was, actually it was because I was going to Rancho La Puerta, my flip phone broke and it was like, you, this we can give you this or you're not gonna have a phone in another country. And I do like texting now, but I always find like it never ends. Like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like, I, I, like you send somebody a text and then they feel like they have to send back something like the heart or whatever. And, and you said that like, you can do something like EOM, like end of message. And I think that's brilliant because I, I, 
on one hand, I don't want to be rude, but it just, there's too much communication after the final communication. Right. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you need to establish those kinds of rules with the people that you're communicating with so that they don't feel like you're ignoring them. Right. And then the story starts, oh, you're rude. Um, and either you're, you're viewing them as rude or you're, you're internalizing, like, I don't want them to think that I'm rude. And it, it, they're the two sides of the same coin. Uh, so you need to establish those rules. And EOM is an excellent one, right, which stands for end of message. So uh, the first time you use that protocol, you just want to let somebody know that, that, it, that that's, you're terminating the, the communication thread or the communication uh, uh, string. And we use it in email all the time. Uh, to, to, and what you can do is you can actually make the subject line in an email the entire message and then terminate it with an EOM. So you don't need to send, you don't need to put anything in the body of the email. The subject was the email. And if you terminate it with an EOM, then you know, like there's not, I don't have to open this message up. I just, I got the message right there. It's like using email in a form like chat, but you can also, with messaging, you can also do it there, right? Like you can terminate your last thing with end of message, which means I don't need you to acknowledge and send me the little heart or the little thumbs up or whatever, the little unicorn symbol. I, we're done until the next time that we need to communicate with each other. So it's curious too. Again, it's another one of those manifestations when where we say, you know, we don't have enough time and yet we waste it in these peculiar little ways that have no value. There's no discernible value to not breaking a thread of communication because you don't want to be the, the first person to stop talking. Do you do the same thing on a text? Because I find that texts sometimes never end. I just don't respond. And, you know, maybe I have, uh, I have, decent boundaries and decent mental health. So I don't take it personally and I don't feel like I have to necessarily communicate with people that I'm not responding. I, I, I don't feel obligated to respond to a text that feels terminal in the, oh. not like terminal, like a death terminal, right? But terminal, like you said what you were supposed to say, right? Like I'll see you at four o'clock. Excellent. I can either give it a thumbs up just to confirm that I got the message. But after that, what I like about certainly with, with, iPhones and Androids, with anything that allows you to, to comment on the last comment with, on their thread rather than having to post an independent thumbs up is I can just thumbs up your thing. It works in, it works in the same way for me. You know that I got it because I gave you the thumbs up or I gave you the heart or I gave you the little exclamation marks. And so you know, I saw it. We're done. I don't need, I don't need to continue that conversation. Great. Uh, Angie says, sometimes I write no need to reply. Yeah. So that's, um, you could do NRN, no reply needed, no reply necessary. You don't even need to write out and no, no ne reply needed. You could just do NRN. All right. Hope says, I resonate with all eight of the time thieves. And Kathy says, I'm reading his book right now. His writing is very good, serious with humor. Yeah, book's great. I, I mean, I, I, I was at Rancho. I took his class, I met him, and I literally bought the book at Rancho and, and listened to the whole thing on Audible while I was still there. It's, it's such a good book. And Charles bought it, too, separately. We didn't even share, it's just so you know. Okay, you. terrific. Okay, I saw, oh, one of the things you said that was great, and I, this is something I've always done naturally because I don't like to drive, is to arrange your errands. That's so great. And I, I bulk, I bulk email answer now too. Like I don't say on email all day. Like I'll take a little bit of time in the morning, a little bit of time in the evening, mostly in the evening and then a little in the afternoon, but I don't, I don't just sit there on the phone all day answering, answering, answering. And oh. with errands, I wait till I, especially cause I don't live near anything anymore. I used to live next door to Trader Joe's and across the street from the mall. If I needed anything, boom, it's not like that. It's 20 minutes to the nearest store. So now I batch, I bulk my errands. And like, I always do that just for grocery sanity as I always go to the farthest one and then the least far and then the one closest to home. Yep. Yeah, so that, uh, and that to, just to expand on that so that everybody understands what we're talking about here. The way that deliveries, if you're ever frustrated when um, you purchase something and they say, we'll call you the day before, uh, and let you know the window of time in which 
you will get your delivery. And you wonder, what's the algorithm? How are they figuring out, like, why did I get that time slot? Because most people would want to either be at the beginning of the day or the end of the day. Nobody wants to be in the middle of the day, right? Like, I want to be the first delivery, or I don't mind being the last delivery, but it's the middle one where you feel like you're held hostage and you can't really do the day because I have to be at home or I have to, you know, I have to be available for that. So when, when this, the dispatcher is planning routes for deliveries, they always go to the furthest location from the warehouse and work their way back so that the last stop is closest to the warehouse so that the truck is done at the end of the day with the last delivery, right? They're not, they're not just randomly driving around based on some other piece of information. It's always furthest to closest to the warehouse, so. And that's what it's like when you used to take the bus to school or camp. And I hated it because I was always the first pickup and the last pickup. Exactly. Right. I mean, they're 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 trying to get on a straight line from the farthest point back to where they're going and vice versa. So, yep. I mean, it's always the drag of like, oh, I'm the last stop. Right. Yep. OK. Uh, I love what you said. There's enough time for what's important when you understand what's important. Yes. Yep. So we've all had the experience of, well, if you're an adult and you've spent, you've been here for any amount of time, right? You've had the experience of being with somebody whose life is winding down. And it's, there hasn't been some tragedy in the sense of like, you know, a plane crash or a car crash or a bus or something like that, God forbid, right? It's just, there's a terminal diagnosis. We understand Bubby's going or, you know, somebody's leaving and the clock is ticking and there's no confusion about the fact that the clock is ticking. In those moments, it's very easy to discern urgent from important because if, it, if you can't spend time with the person who's leaving, if it isn't important, it falls off the list immediately. So it's a great way to use a skill that we have developed in a crisis in a non-crisis moment so that we use that tool to discern, to discern where do I want to put my time and what is really important to me versus busy. And it goes back to your guy, uh, you know, your, your record mogul guy and sending the handwritten note. It was important for you to send him the challah it was important for him to write the handwritten note. And that was, that was him living his values. Returning an unnecessary phone call, that was something your friend Elaine could do, right? I mean, that was something he could delegate. He didn't need to spend his time doing that. Expressing his gratitude because you were thoughtful, he was matching your thoughtfulness. And that was living his value. So it's the same thing. We, we have these opportunities throughout the day to make big choices and small choices in alignment with our values and to recognize this is just a distraction. This is not going to get me any closer. It's not going to improve the quality of their life. It's not going to do anything uh, to improve the quality of my life. I'm just burning through some time. And even if you're taking a nap in a hammock, reading a book, that's not burning through time if it's a deliberate choice that you're making. It's only when you're unconscious and not clear about, I'm choosing to spend my time doing this. This is what I want to do and how I want to spend my time. And I'm not going to regret having spent this time, right? We don't know when this experience is going to end. I would prefer that nobody get to the end of it and, and say to themselves, I want a do-over. If I would have known that this was how it was going to play itself out, I would have made different choices. At that moment, you, you don't have the option of making different choices. But right now, right now, this exact moment, you do have the opportunity to make a different choice. So what are you going to spend your time doing? Yeah, thank you. Tomorrow is a promise that may never be delivered. I like that. Mm-hmm. Very, yeah. it's so true. Oh, I like the uh, thing you said about Warren Buffett. That the difference between successful people and unsuccessful people is the ability to say no. It's actually the difference between successful and very successful people. Oh, sorry. Is is how much more they say no. And Warren Buffett says no to a lot of things, as you can imagine. And so what he's saying yes to must really be important to him because he's, he's very comfortable saying no. 
<laughs> so that, that's the takeaway, right? Is if you, if you have that desire to up your game, whatever that means to you, you wanna be more productive, you wanna be more successful, uh, you wanna be more relaxed, develop the ability to say no. And it is one of the eight deadly time thieves, right? Is overcommitting, uh, being a people pleaser. It's, uh, it's one of the surefire ways to give away your time. So you have to be mindful. It's your time. You can spend it exactly as you want. If anybody is telling you a story about how they're entitled to your time, that's one of their 200 lies and you don't need to take that and internalize it. You know, it's just so funny how we get so many emails to our website from people I don't even know just asking me to call them. Like, <laughs> Oh, I, well, but I mean, again, I don't know how many of those are bots, right? I get emails all the time. Andrew, I, you know, we want to help you with, with your marketing. Hey, Andrew, this. I, hey, Andrew, I'd like to write a guest blog post for you. But it's not even from a real person. So I used to have my assistant reply to all of them. And then I, at some point I discovered they're just bots because when you start to recognize the pattern and the English isn't particularly good. It sounds like it's AI English, right? Uh, artificial intelligence English. They're not full grammatically correct sentences. And if you're wanting to be a guest writer on my blog, I would think that grammar would be particularly important to you in your cover letter to me. So if, if it's not good grammar, I'm inclined not to respond nor to spend uh, my money paying my assistant to respond to a bot, not necessary. Right. What do you mean by figure out your 20%? Oh, well, that just goes to the Pareto principle. Um, Pareto was a 19th century economist. You, you, some people may have heard of the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. So Pareto, uh, 19th century economist, discovered that 80% of the land in Italy was controlled by 20% of the population. And then he started to recognize this 80-20 relationship playing itself out other places. And so there is a theory, in, certainly in business, that 20% of your efforts, the best 20% of your efforts, actually yields 80% of your revenue. So if you could just double down on whatever that 20% is and do more of it, you would, in essence, increase your revenue by 100% by only leveraging another 20%. So in my business, the two things that drive the needle most for us are public appearances like this. Whenever I'm speaking publicly, we, we always build business because once people, sometimes it sounds either vague or a little woo-woo or inconsequential, like it's a soft skill, right? Managing your time or managing or getting organized sounds like it's a soft skill and it's not like uh, engineering or, some, you know, or science. And yet it's a, fundamental, it's, a, it's a fundamental factor in your success. If you are messy and disorganized, you will be less productive and less effective, whatever that means to you. And so uh, often I think on the page, it's sometimes hard for people to understand, well, how would I benefit from what Andrew is teaching? What's the takeaway or how, how would I be able to quantify or where would the metrics be on my return on this investment? And so once I'm speaking and people understand both the passion and the clarity that I bring to this subject matter, suddenly people are like, oh, this makes total sense. We need you to come speak here. We need to hire you to do this. We, we want to work with you over here to do this. So the two things that I do, and so back to the idea of social media and all of those things, I write a blog, we post stuff to social media. That doesn't really do much to move the needle inside the business. It's almost busy work. It does help a certain amount with SEO because there's fresh content being pumped out, but it is not a clear transactional ROI that we can see from those kinds of activities. Me speaking and me attending networking events, even though I'm, I am an, an introvert and would prefer to only speak to one person at a time or to speak to thousands on a stage, those are the two places where I feel the most comfortable, right? Intimate one-to-one -one conversations like you and I are having right now or one to 10,000 on a stage. The stuff in between, cocktail parties freak me out. I mean, I will go to them. Networking parties, it's always good for me to have a wing person with me so that I have somebody that I feel like if I'm not making the connections, they're, they're much 
uh, more adept at starting the conversations because I like to go deep right away. I don't do surface chat easily. I, I like what's going on, let's solve a problem, let's do something, let's make some impact, let's connect. That's what interests me. Talking about the weather, it's like, well, I live in Florida. It's, it's either it, there's a hurricane or it's sunny, right? I mean, it's one of two flavors. There's not, we're done talking about the weather, right? I mean, it's another beautiful day in paradise, a, a little humid, right? I mean, we don't really need to spend a lot of time talking about that. So I want, to get to, I want to get to something meaty and juicy, and I want to understand who you are and what's important to you. And I want, if we're going to spend any time together, I want you to know who I am. Anything else is, it feels like a waste of my time. So networking events and public speaking are the two most important things for me to, and, and followed by creating content and, you know, teaching. Uh, teaching and coaching. Those are the ways that I personally create impact inside my business. That's my 20%. So if, we're, if I'm spending my time proofreading uh, a blog or writing an email, that is a low impact task for me and I need to spend more time doing the things that actually push the needle forward for the business. That's, you want to extrapolate that on for you, right? Like, whether it's you specifically, AJ, in your, in your business, or anybody who's listening to this, when we're looking for your 20%, what are, it doesn't always have to be about business, but like, what's the 20% that yields the, the biggest 80% impact at home? Is it making the bed and cl keeping the counters clear, right? Maybe, maybe some of the cupboards are not ideal, but the surfaces are always clear and the bed's made. Where do you get the biggest bang for your buck? That's where you want to put your intention, uh, attention because that's where you're going to see the biggest results. Thank you. That's fantastic. You said something really profound that a to-do list isn't a plan. Yes. No. To-do lists are a, a way for you to get things off of your brain so that you're not just on that hamster wheel spinning, trying to remember like, oh, don't forget to do this. Don't forget to do this. So you can write it down on a to-do list, but a to-do list isn't a time management tool. Your calendar is a time management tool because it's about time. It's about time. A timer is a time management tool. A to-do list is a way to stop trying to remind yourself of something. And as a rule, it is better to, if you're going to have multiple to-do lists, make sure they are about different discrete topics, categories, or what I call time buckets, right? So your errands should all be on one to-do list about errands that shouldn't be confused with going to see the dermatologist or returning a, uh, you know, returning a package to your neighbor that you borrowed from them. We want to, often people have difficulty prioritizing because they have competing things that would be in a number one slot, right? It's important to go to the doctor. It's also important to return the library book before the fine happens. They're not equivalent. And probably going to the doctor is going to have more impact than the 15 cents or the 50 cents that you would get as the library fine. I'd still rather you didn't w waste the 15 cents or the 50 cents. So that probably is more important than, you know, dropping off the hangers at the dry cleaners to recycle them. So that when we're prioritizing, we're still prioritizing based on importance, but we don't have things that have nothing to do with each other competing for top position. Makes sense. You said something like the last 10% of a project requires 90% more effort. It does, sadly. It's why so many people have a wake of unfinished projects behind them. It's why I talk often about the end of doing the laundry is a basket of is an empty basket back on top of the dryer. That's the full arc of doing the laundry. The basket's now ready for more clean clothes. The end of doing the laundry is not a basket of clean clothes on your bedroom floor, even if they're folded, right? You, know, you don't live out of the basket. The clothes get put away, the basket's empty. That's the full arc of the task. Often people get three quarters of the way through, nine tenths of the way through, and then they walk away. They tell themselves one of their 200 lies. Oh, I'll put that away later. Oh, I'll just button that up later. It'll take me five minutes. It'll take me 10 minutes. I just don't have the 10 minutes now, but I will definitely have it later. And then inevitably you end up at the bottom of the basket of the laundry, right? There's a couple of pairs of socks. There's a couple of pairs of underwear. And you tell yourself another one of your 200 lies. Well, at this point, I mean, there's barely anything in here. I'll just wait till the next time I do laundry and then I'll put it all away, right? Why bother now? It's, all, it's, it's almost finished. And it, it just, 
it, if you have those days where you, you, you look back on it, you think, gosh, I started a million things today. I didn't finish a single one. That's the manifestation of that. So you just, that's clutter. It's just deferred decisions. You just got to go back and clean it all up. So it's much better to put it away now. It's like buying things on time too. If you're smart about using the 0% interest hook that, that companies will offer you, do it. I, I bought my computer that way, right? I allowed Apple to finance the purchase of my computer because I knew that I could pay it off in 12 months. If you don't pay it off in 12 months, suddenly you owe them 30% interest on top of what you just bought. So they all, there's always a gotcha built into that if you fall off, the, off their system. So you just, it's not a bargain if you are not able to make those p payments and then you get that balloon interest at the end of it. It's the same thing. It's, you've deferred the interest and now it's come home to roost. Got it. Thank you. Here yeah. is a question from Hope, who's watching live. I'd love to know, are there any major feelings or circumstances which tend to click in someone's mind and motivate them to succeed in decluttering and organizing? Hmm. I think it goes back to your values, Hope. And uh, I don't know that there's universals. I think if you would do the core value exercises and understand for yourself, what's really important to you. And you can download those from my website. If you go to the uh, For Audible listeners uh, tab in the footer, you can download them for free. They're also in my book, Unstuff Your Life. So you can get them there. I mean, you don't have to do mine. You could Google core value exercises and do somebody else's, but mine are available to you. If you are super clear about what is important to you, it becomes easier to leverage your resistance noise against, but I re that's really important to me because we've all had the experience. I mean, this is when you see the moms who pick up Volkswagen bugs, right? That are about to roll over their children. And you think, how did a woman pick up a, you know, a 3000 pound car? It's because something was more important to her than, than whatever her limitations were of like, well, I can't pick up a car. I guess that's gonna roll over my child, right? So in matters of life or death, it's very easy to distinguish urgent from important. In our day-to-day -day life, it sometimes becomes harder to figure that out. So being able to leverage what is important to you to get you through something. And I always say both winners do what they have to do. Everyone else does what they want to do. So if you want what you want, you're going to do it. Michael Phelps, I use this example all the time. Michael Phelps won 19 gold medals because after he won 14 gold medals, he still was in the swimming pool every morning at six o'clock swimming with his coach because he wasn't finished. He wanted another five gold medals. So he was gonna go back to the Olympics and see what he could do, right? It would be very easy for him to rest on his laurels and say, look, I'm the best swimmer in the world. I've got 14 gold medals. I'm gonna get high with my buddies or I'm gonna you know, take the day off and not, uh, not get into the pool. He did what was required of him because he wanted what he wanted, which was an opportunity to compete at the Olympics one more time and scoop up as many more medals as he could. So if you want to do your equivalent of that, you will remind yourself winners do what they have to do, not what they want to do. They do what they have to do. And if I want to be a winner, whatever that means to you, right? It's not a competition with anybody except yourself. If you want whatever it is that you want more than you don't want it, you will go to any lengths to get it. That's, the, that's one thing. And then the other part of that is that failure breeds failure, success breeds success. So every time you can value stack your successes, you create a little platform for you to stand on of, well, I did this and I didn't think I could. I did that and I didn't think I could do that. I did this. Look at all the things that I actually managed to do that I didn't think I was able to do. I actually could do this too. So I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it now, or I'm going to make an, a discreet appointment with myself that I will actually then keep right? We don't defer things to someday or later. We say, I can't do it now, but I can do it at four o'clock. I will do it at four o'clock and then do it at four o'clock. Thank you. Susanna says, this is so motivating. And you know, when you think of like that show hoarders, that really is just decision after decision being deferred. You know, you know I think about you all the time because I'm, I'm, I've gotten so much better at, uh, at keeping, because I think getting organized is the equivalent of losing weight. They are both actually quite easy. What is difficult 
is keeping the weight off and staying organized. Exactly. And that is what you teach and I teach. And so a lot of times I let things slide, like, like for example, because I am kind of rushed. I mean, I, I'm not saying I don't have enough time, but I, I'm overcommitted and that's something I will work on. But like, for example, like I'll take a shower and I have these two towels and I'm rushing to get to the show so I won't hang them up. And then I see them on the floor and I'm like, your voice comes in my head. I'm like, well, if I don't have time to do it now, I'm not going to have time to do it later. So I'm just going to do it now. And that's kind of what I've been doing with the kitchen and other things. And it, it makes it much easier to maintain a serene environment when, when you don't keep deferring these. I mean, it's different. Like if the house is on fire, then I'm not going to hang up the towel. You don't but need to, it, they'll dry out. Right. If I'm going to be 30 seconds late for the show because of it, I'm going to be 30 seconds late for the show because it does make a difference because then I come in after the show and like the towels on the floor. It's like, yeah. yeah, it's, it's, an, it's, these are all little subtle ways that we sap our energy and our motivation and our forward mo momentum. And they do it, it, that value stacking is, has deep psychological and emotional impact. So I would much rather walk around my house and see everything where it belongs and not see piles of things uh, because it means that I'm, my time is now mine to do what I want with it. I don't have to pay back the past in the present or in the future. I'm not having to dig, to dig myself out of a little time debt or clutter debt. I'm able to be present for this moment so that if you call me up and say, hey, you wanna go get some vegan ice cream? I'm free to say yes. Not, well, I'd love to, but I got to go make my bed. And then I got a couple of emails that I got to answer. And when that's done, I'll check back with you and see if you still want to go. Nice. nice. And speaking of which, there is a place in St. Pete, when you come to visit me, that has amazing plant-based ice cream. Oh my God, that's fantastic. You know, one of the questions I get a lot, uh, because I knew you were going to be on the show, is when it's not so much sentimental, but like people get things from people as gifts. And they're, it's not like an aunt that they're never going to see, but people that are in their regular social sphere and they feel compelled like to have them out on display because you, you know, you don't want to hurt people's feelings, but what if you're somebody that gets a lot of gifts from your friends, what do you do? Because then you're, you're putting things out that maybe aren't your taste or, you know, how, how do you deal with that? Well, uh, how I very specifically deal with that is that I let my friends know that I love them, uh, that it's probably better to never buy me a thing uh, unless you're okay with me not keeping it, right? So the best gifts for me are consumables, meaning food, literally food or flowers, things that I will enjoy that have a life cycle. Uh, I love flowers. Anybody can send me flowers anytime they want. And I love food. I love to eat. So send me food. I will always, I mean, unless it's garbage food, right? I will always put it in my mouth. So we don't have to worry about that. Don't buy me a, th I, I, I'm an adult. I have everything I need. So I don't need a new spatula unless you heard me saying, oh, my favorite spatula got chewed up in the garbage disposal. I am so disappointed. I have to go try to find another one of those spatulas. And I have to remember like, did I get it at Sur La Table or did I get it at William Sonoma or you know, where did I, where did I find it? Crate and Barrel, where did that spatula come from? I have to go get another one. Short of me needing to replace something, which is the third leg of the triangle, right? Something in, something out. I don't need anything. So that's how I move through time and space. And the people who love me know that about me and they're not offended. They don't think I'm rude. Maybe they think I'm rude. I don't care. I, I'm, I'm very clear about my, my boundaries around that. And if you want to give me something, you just have to be prepared that it might not make the cut. Nothing freely given should ever be a burden. So if you are giving gifts, you should give them with no expectations that they are going to love it just because you love it. It's not, they're not obligated to love it the way you love it. They're obligated to receive it with love because you gave it with love and say, oh my God, I love you. Thank you so much for thinking of me. Not my taste. I'm, do you mind if I re-gift this or I can let this go? And if you're not comfortable with that, you probably shouldn't be giving people gifts. Yeah, and exactly. when you get them, you should be, I mean, you, you should be able to say, I love you, don't know really what to do with this. Um, how do you feel? I mean, look, what's, if they are, if they love you, 
you should be able to have a frank conversation, which is not aggressive or confrontational in some sort of bullying way to say, I love you, I don't love this thing. How would you feel if I let it go? My feelings would be hurt. Oh, okay, well, should I give it back to you? Well, I mean, what, what, what's, the, what's the least negative impact that you could experience with this thing? Right? Or break down for me, like, why you think it's perfect. For, like, what made you think that this was a good choice for me? Explain to me the, the thought process behind it, and maybe my attitude towards it will change. Or I will never like it because I don't like these kinds of things. Right? I mean, but at least it opens up a conversation. Now you're actually talking to the people you love. Yeah. Well, I agree with you, especially as people get older, people tend not to need things. And I think food gifts, like especially things, you know, they like, like California balsamic vinegar mm. is the way to go. Because I always feel like when people give me, you know, clothing or hats or jewelry, like I'm obligated to wear it on the show because otherwise I'll hurt their feelings. Yeah, you're not. Yeah, you're not. And uh, look, I mean, that's just about having healthy boundaries, right? Wow. Oh, so uh, people are really loving this, they're saying. And there is a question from Susanna. Do you think gift cards are a good gift since they're consumable and people can use them to purchase food or things they might really want? I think they are a qualified good gift. Uh, un un um, uncashed in, I'm sure there's a more elegant word for that, uncashed in gift cards total uh, multiple billions of dollars every year. So if you're giving them to somebody who is disorganized, it's, they might get lost. Uh, so it depends on who you're giving them to. Uh, and if you're giving them, if it's like an American Express gift card that could be used anywhere versus a store credit at Sur La Table or, you know, Nordstrom Rack or wherever, wherever it is, then they have to go someplace specific to use it. Now, if it's someplace that you know that they're already going, right? If they shop at Trader Joe's and you can buy them a $100 gift, gift certificate for Trader Joe's and you know that that's where they grocery shop, then that seems like a no brainer and hopefully they wouldn't lose it. And hopefully Trader Joe's has some sort of tracking on the receipt that even if they do lose the card that we could still then go get the card replaced. With all of that in mind, I think they can be useful. You just want to match something that is small and easily misplaced with the person you're giving it to, to make sure that they don't misplace it. Right, that makes sense. There's a question from Michelle. How do you come back from interruptions? I'm a full-time caregiver for my quadriplegic son. His needs are almost always urgent and can't wait five minutes. Yep, so... Um... The way that you come back from interruptions, if you can, and I understand with your, with your son, the, the immediacy and the urgency of a need may be pulling you away and you don't have the opportunity to leave a little trail of breadcrumbs to remind yourself of where you were. If it were possible, depending on how acute the need is in the moment, right? If you had 15 seconds, 20 seconds to write yourself a note of this is where I'm, this is like to, you know, put a stake in the ground. Like this is where I was so I can return, I can find my way back to here and pick up from there. That would be ideal if you could do something like that. If you can't do something like that, then it, it is one of the costs associated with caring for your child that also is a factor that needs to be accounted for, right? It's not a cost that you need to feel bad about or try to leverage in some way other than to just recognize that along with everything else that comes with caring for your child is also that you're going to lose time as you re-enter. Once he's stabilized or whatever's been addressed has been addressed, and now you're back doing what you were doing previously, that there's going to be some decay and some loss. And so that you're, you're aware of it going in so that you're not surprised on your way out. The, forewarned is forearmed. So the more you know there's gonna be some burn on re-entry, then you're less surprised when you're like, I can't remember, what was I doing? I, I was in the middle of something and then, you know, this thing came up and I had to run away and go do it. And now like, what was I doing? Just accept that there's gonna be a certain amount of time that you're, you're gonna to have to recreate your steps. 
The statistic around interruptions is that, and this has nothing to do with your son, right? The average person is interrupted by communications technology every 10 minutes. And on average, it takes 23 minutes to recover from one of those, one of those interruptions. So it could mean as much as 33 minutes are lost due to one interruption. The more we can hold on to that, it doesn't need to become any more significant than it is, but the more you can hold on to that piece of information as you are trying to re-enter whatever it is that you were doing, you'll have some compassion for yourself, understanding, well, you know, it only took me 12 minutes to get back to where I was. It could have taken me 33 minutes. I guess I'm ahead of, like I'm on this side of the bell curve rather than that side of the bell curve. But you, you want to be able to budget for it and anticipate it rather than being surprised by it. In, in essence, that becomes like a lose-lose, right? Because you have the consequences of the interruption and then you're somehow surprised by how scattered or uh, unfocused you are as you're trying to re-enter. Thank you. And any tips for procrastination? Well, eat the frog. I mean, that's- yeah, I love thing. that. I mean, that is like exercise for me. I mean, cause I, there's no way I'm going to do something I don't like later, but what about like um, uh, linking? So for example, I, I only allow myself my guilty pleasure show if I'm on the bike. Okay. You know what I'm saying on Netflix? Like I won't, I, I can't, I don't have time to watch. I don't have regular TV, but I do enjoy watching shows, but I'm not, I don't have time. So if I'm on the spin bike, I get to watch call my agent. Awesome. I love that show. Isn't it great? I know. I just, yeah. Who's your favorite character? Um, I, well, I love so many of them. I love, I, yeah, I mean, I They're love. They're all so good. They're so, just, yeah. I mean, I love the, the lesbian agent single mom. I love the guy, oh, yeah. like the, the guy who was. Um, who wanted to be the agent that was partnering with the daughter of... With Camille, with Camille, yeah. Right. I mean, I loved him, his little drama thing, and then he decided to become an actor, right? Uh, the guy, the the sort of sad sack Eeyore agent who had the beautiful uh, Afro-French... Yeah girlfriend. I mean, they're just all delicious. I love the little, the old little agent with her little dog, right? Yeah, I mean, they're just, they're, they're all, all they're, they're wonderful. all wonderful. And I love that every episode is a cameo from some amazing French or, you know, French speaking actor. It's just, it's, it's such a good show. And you know, the lady that plays the wife of the guy that's, you know, I, I can't yeah. think of his name, but she is like, she plays such a different character in Emily in Paris. Yes, like, she does. So, we love that about she's her. She's beautiful. And yeah. but she's sweet in this show and the other show, she's really mean. Yes, she is. I love Emily in Paris too. It's a total guilty pleasure. I love that you love We want story. an Emily in Paris. We are looking for an Emily in Paris for my company. So if anybody wow. out there is Emily in Paris, um, you can, uh, you can direct message me. I would love to hear from you. Oh my God. <laughs> that is that's hilarious. So we have a vegan audience here and they're like, eat the frog. Frogs aren't vegan. Yeah. Well, it's a metaphor. You don't have to literally eat a frog. It was coined by Mark Twain and then made popular by a colleague of mine, Brian Tracy. The idea is if you eat a live frog first thing in the morning, the rest of the day gets better. So you do the thing that you don't want to do first thing. That's why I teach vegetables for breakfast, because if people hate vegetables, they're not going to like at eight o'clock at night after they've had dessert say, oh, yeah, I think it's a good idea to eat a salad now. Right. Yeah. yeah, you're just yeah. I like I'm sorry, I'm going to I know I've kept you over, but you're just so fun to talk to and you're so wise. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I feel it's the so same way fun. about you. Well, I'm telling everybody to buy from your link and I keep posting it. So if they haven't Thank bought, you. look at how much time and value Andrew has given you. And you're going to get more than that if you get the bundle because his course is in there and it's $97 on his website. It's not a trick. It really is something he's always yeah. sold. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's so, I mean, I said that to you, I think maybe before we got on camera, right? It's not like I... I gathered up a piece of garbage that was laying in the back room and was like, here, let me into the bundle. Here's a piece of crap. You can, we'll slap a price tag on it and you can give it to people. We, we've sold hundreds of copies of uh, Calling BS on Busy uh, for, the, for the full price of $97. So yeah, so you're- it's, it's, As my mom would say, such a deal. Yes, exactly. Have you had a chance to look at the bundle? Is there anything that caught your eye? 
Oh, I, 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 I've downloaded it, but to be perfectly honest, I have not spent any time going through it. I, just to see that the breadth of the people that you brought together is mind blowing. I mean, so many smart, smart people in, in your world more than in my world. And of course, I feel so uh, grateful to be included as an outlier, right? Somebody who's, who is sympathetic and simpatico in our mindset around the way that we do our work. But I mean, you've got a hundred food people and fitness people and health people and me. And I love that I'm, I get to be a part of this world and bring something of value to the community. And it also is a completely different flavor from, for, and everything else is not all the same flavor, but it's all of a piece around either weight loss, vegan, raw, um, food something, fitness something, and then we've got time management. And I think that the compliment is, I think it's just, it's true. I, I, it's, you're, you're gonna be less successful. You're gonna struggle more to change your diet, to change your food, your relationship with food, if you're running out of time, if you don't have the time. Because learning anything requires a certain amount of attention and focus. And if you don't have the time to do it, you're gonna do it half-assed. You're not gonna get the results you want. You're gonna blame the system or whatever it was. Like, oh, you see, this was just more garbage. Like, I, this is, didn't work for me. Well, but you didn't give it the time and attention it needed to get the results that you wanted. So really, where's the problem? Is the problem in the system or is the problem in your, your lack of consistency? Right. Well, great. Thank you. So buy the bundle, buy it now and buy it from Andrew, <laughs> read his book, take his course and just make sure you're in his world because he's absolutely right. And let, if you are not organized, if you do not have control over your time, you're never going to be able to eat right, exercise, have enough time for sleep, all the stuff that really matters. Always great connecting with you. Thank you so much, Likewise. Andrew. My pleasure. I'll see you soon. I hope so. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in about 35 minutes when we have